I can't wait for the post office guy to interrupt. Welcome back to my channel. As you've noticed, I haven't made a video in a little while. I had two jobs for a little bit, but now one of those jobs is done, so I can make things more often, which is fun and exciting. I keep forgetting this game is called Master Detective Archives Rain Code. I feel like we could eliminate many of the words, like Project Rain Code. I think an old working title of the game was Enigma Archives, which like less specific, but also shorter, a little easier to say, a lot less syllables. Oh, is that the post office guy? The question is, is he going to use the buzzer and end my life? Or is he just going to put it in my mailbox because it's small enough to fit in my mailbox? Also, quick thank you for 600 subscribers. How fun and nice. Thank you for doing that for me. Um, if you enjoy this video and want to subscribe as well, it is free and I can't recommend it enough, really. It'd actually be like a detriment for you if you weren't. Okay, I just finished Rain Code. For the purposes of this video, I'm just calling it Rain Code because that's shorter and that's what it is. I just finished it this weekend. Uh, I was playing it the other night and I was a little... And I was playing the end of the game and I was screaming at the television. I was freaking out. A lot of this game, not very good, but it goes really hard in the last chapter. With that being said, this is going to be like a semi-spoiler review. I'm going to talk about the first five chapters of the game and I'm not going to talk about the last one. It just goes like in a completely different direction and I feel like everything that I talk about in this video isn't going to be relevant in a discussion about the last chapter of the game because it just really goes somewhere else. It's an excellent culmination of like the drip fed clues that you're getting throughout the game. I just think with everything that I talk about today, it's not going to be relevant to the end and I might make a separate video about it, but just like what happens in the last chapter is so like far gone from everything that happens before it. And also like this game isn't that old and it didn't sell like crazy. So if people want to play it without being spoiled, I think it'd be fun to leave that open for them because my unspoiled experience was insane. If you want to hear me talk about the ending, I'm willing to do that. Just comment down below. I just think it requires a different level of care. I was confused initially when I saw that Rain Code had an 8 on Metacritic, because a lot of this game is like really boring, I think. I really struggled to emotionally invest in what was going on. I find that a lot of the characters aren't very likable, but now that I've played it all the way through, I get it. Also, kind of comes with the territory of these games. People die in many ways, so if that's like a sensitive subject for you, proceed with caution or consider logging off. There just is no way for me to talk around the murder, because it's the whole conceit. Rain Code is the spiritual successor to Danganronpa. Rain Code is like Danganronpa, but worse, in my opinion. Rain Code, I think, structurally tries to match Danganronpa in a lot of ways, and the structure of Danganronpa works for those games, but it doesn't work for Rain Code. Story-wise, they're both about solving, like, episodic murders chapter by chapter, and those stories remain pretty isolated, but in the background, there's always, like, a looming, bigger mystery. It usually has something to do with where the story is set. So Rain Code and Danganronpa are similar in that way. Things I liked about Rain Code, visually, the game is very stunning. Apparently it's been made in a new Switch kind of proprietary development kit that I guess makes it easier to make prettier games for the system. It performed pretty well for the most part. There was some like pop-in issues and like sometimes the character portraits wouldn't change or like load in quickly enough when they were talking. Loading screens are also kind of an issue in this game because there's a lot of pre-rendered cutscenes. The pre-rendered cutscenes all look really great. They're beautiful. And I think like the animation is really good. The cinematography in those scenes is really good. But you know, there's usually like a 10 second loading screen. And sometimes there's two of those scenes back to back. And then there's a loading screen between them. And sometimes that can be a little bit much. I think the general aesthetic of neon nights in the rain is really beautiful, really striking. They go for this kind of like cyberpunk thing, but with the giant storm clouds that loom over this skyscraper metropolis kind of city, it creates for a really looming atmosphere. I think it contributes to the central themes of like authority and control because the game takes place in Kanai Ward, which is isolated from the rest of the world. Very few people get in or out and it's all being controlled by like a game equivalent of Amazon called the Amaterasu Corporation. Like imagine if Amazon had a town, but no one could get in or out. I think most of the character designs are ugly. 
maybe just not to my taste. Um, I think some of them look good. I like Yuma's design. Maybe it's because his is the simplest and a lot of the other ones just have certain like color clashing that I find to be like really unsatisfying. The character designs weren't my favorite, but I also appreciate that they maintained a pretty solid through line of trying to make rain wear, but cyberpunk and cool because it's the city of perpetual rain. So it makes sense that everyone is going to have pretty solid outdoor wear. I'll touch on this a little bit more when I talk about the plot, but I think the mystery labyrinths largely look cool. I wish that they were more differentiated from one another, but some of the visual effects inside the labyrinth are just stunning. Like all of the abstract art is very evocative of like what Madoka Magica tries to do in its art style. There's probably a real artist that it's based on that I don't know. They're essentially just like big hallways, but there's like a tile flipping effect that ripples down the hallway and then the look of the room changes. And it is so like visually stimulating and satisfying. I've kind of touched on this already. I don't like pretty much any character in this game, but I do think the main character, Yuma Coco Head, what a name. They're not going to get any better. His set of circumstances are really interesting. Like, I don't like him as a character. I think he's annoying. I think he's kind of a brat. And he also has amnesia. And this shouldn't be a shocker because every title where someone has amnesia, they obviously get their memories back at some point. Amnesia doesn't function like that because he kind of has a different personality. He's more confident and uh, less whiny when he has his full memories. I couldn't take him very seriously. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't feel, I don't feel your struggle. I find his given circumstances to be really interesting. Basically, Yuma has made a deal with a death god called Shinigami. He's exchanged his memories for the power to enter these mystery labyrinths, which are a manifestation of the mystery. So we can go in there and through solving each of the questions posed in front of him, he gets closer and closer to the truth until it's like irrefutable. The cost of finding that truth is that the person who committed the crime dies. There's the potential here to explore really interesting ethical questions as to like how worth it the execution of the law is or how important finding the truth is. The game like talks about it and I think they know at a base level that that's an important thing, but I think the script writing is so bad that they're not able to meaningfully discuss that. They kind of touch on it in chapter four, but instead of being like, you know, your actions have consequences and maybe the consequences aren't worth the power that you hold. Maybe there's an, maybe there's a better way to solve the mystery. Maybe you can just do it for real and not take advantage of your power. That's never brought into question. It's more like, are you going to do it to find the truth? How interested are you in the truth? You're blind to the truth. Like it's so, what's another word for basic? It's shallow. It's really shallow in its exploration. In my mind, it's interesting to imagine this character like 20 years in the future, still with this death god power. Like, what does that do to your personhood? Especially a character like this who is a whiny little baby. Where is he when he's like 40? When he's like a hardened, gruff gumshoe? Raincoat is also very ACAB, which is honestly kind of refreshing. A lot of games really go up for the police. I am not sure if the game is explicitly trying to comment on the legal system and on the way that justice is executed in societies. I don't really think it's going there, but I think you can very easily look at this game and take away the message that not all legal procedures are ethical because at the end of the day, we rely on human arbiters to make those decisions and they're not always going to be perfect. So that's everything I liked. Uh, now we're going to talk about the story. <laughs> the game is conveniently split up into chapters, so it's pretty easy to parse. They go from zero through five. Zero is the prologue chapter. It also made me want to gouge my eyes out. It was really boring. It probably is not longer than five hours, but it felt like it took me a week to get through. I was so bored. It's so dry. All of the characters introduced here are detestable. I'm glad they die at the end of the chapter so we don't have to follow them throughout the game. I was like, this is really brutal. I feel like I'm eating sand. I just couldn't. It was really boring, um, but it does set up the main conflict of the game in terms of like entity versus entity because it's the World Detective Organization versus the Amaterasu Corporation because they're obviously hiding a big secret in Kanai Ward so they're sending in these mystery detectives to figure out what's going on and also one of the main pieces is that master detectives specifically all have a superpower that is supposed to aid them in solving mysteries. I think one thing the game overlooks is that no one else has a superpower like it's only 
the detectives, which that just doesn't seem realistic to me. Like everyone in My Hero Academia has a quirk. Even if they're not all useful, everyone has a power in that universe because that's part of the whole deal. I just think it's odd that conveniently all the superheroes happen to work at the same office. One thing I do want to commend them on is that all the characters in this game have like non-traditional powers. Like at least they try to take creative swings in terms of having like passive abilities. Like one of the characters has super hearing, but not in the hero's way where that lady could hear everyone and she was in her own personal hell. Like she has a focused version of it. So if she's listening for something, she can isolate that sound. Another character has perfect disguises. Another character can go back to the scene of a crime, but only when it was first found by a witness who wasn't the killer. It's an interesting approach to doing the superpower thing because you can do it in a lot of different ways and even seemingly useless powers might contribute towards finding a solution. Anyways, I don't have a ton to say about this chapter because once again, all the characters die. They're really boring. It's a bad setup. Like the hook here isn't good. I'm not captivated. Also, the script in general is like POV. You're in middle school and you submit like a script for a play for something and it's a first draft and the teacher just lets you like go with it like it's just it's really on the nose there's no minutiae it's like the writers went in knowing like this is the character's thing this is the character's thing this is the character's thing and we are not going to work outside of those stereotypes that we're assigning them literally at all we're not even going to try this character wants to kill people and wants to get into fights that's it this character has a weird fetish thing about clothes. That is, that's literally all. She, she's the quiet girl. I don't want to hear her. She's not speaking. And when she does speak, it's going to be a little bit. That's it. We're sticking to our guns. No depth. No depth in this house. We arrive on this train. Yuma has no memories, doesn't know who he is. And it's so obvious he's going to get framed and that the whole mystery has to do with the train. Because we're getting all these weird details like the doors don't open, the windows don't open, one of the car doors is locked, a bunch of doors in the train are locked. Like, it was a little sus. There's no conductor. The only people on the train are the six people who are there. And then one of the characters has a really odd line of dialogue where they say, like, there's only six living bodies on the train. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, because maybe no one said that and I just made that up. But I'm pretty sure... That is said. And I was like, wow, no person would ever say living bodies. They would just say there's six people on the train. I'm sure there's going to be a dead body switcheroo thing that happens later. And certainly it does because there is an extra dead body stowed on the train. Look at me go. It was also just like convoluted. Like the whole train thing was a setup from the beginning because there's five cars, but the train only departed with four cars in reality. And there was an extra car at the arriving and like departure stations to give the illusion that there's five cars and one of the cars detaches and then goes around on another thing and then reconnects at the front again to make you think that there's five cars. Like it was just so much. And I was like, whoa, this is where we're starting. We're starting with train car hijinks. And then the mystery labyrinth takes 20 million years. And also the tutorials are like, this is clearly a game for babies. We can't let you even literally move. If we don't tell you that you have to click the A button to interact with things, you cannot proceed. You can't. Stop right there. You're too stupid to go forward. Like, it was just so frustrating because I was like, okay, this all seems pretty straightforward. Like, this is a rated M game. You can't even buy it if you're under 17. And no one is buying this as their first ever game. I know what's happening here. You know what's happening here. The control stick moves the character. Can we move on? Visually, I like the mystery dungeons, but the gameplay? Brutal. Here, they try to emulate Danganronpa as well. Basically, there are sequences in both Danganronpa and Rain Code where in Danganronpa, it's a group of characters. In Rain Code, it's just one, where someone is talking and then each line of dialogue comes one at a time and they're color-coded. So like white lines of dialogue usually don't mean anything, but then a certain color means that there's something there 
that you can dispute using one of the pieces of information that you've picked up along the way in your investigation. Both of them have the same cadence, but in Danganronpa, it makes more sense because it's a room full of people arguing back and forth for five to ten lines of dialogue, let's say. So it just feels a lot more natural, and the pacing of it makes sense, especially because if a bunch of people are chiming in, there's more opportunity for like the topic to switch between them or for different people to posit ideas, and then your character can chime in and say, that's wrong because of this. In Danganronpa, it makes a lot of sense. In Rain Code, it doesn't. The sequences in Rain Code are all pretty much like one character who generally is talking about the same thing, but for five to ten lines of dialogue, and they might bring up the same topic three times, but in almost every instance, it's the last thing that they say that's the issue. Also, in Danganronpa, it shows you at the bottom how many times someone is going to speak in that segment, whereas in Rain Code, you have no idea. So sometimes the character will just like stop talking, and you don't know when they're going to stop, whereas in Danganronpa, you know that you only have like seven opportunities to find the solution, and it's in one of those seven. It's just a little bit easier for the player. I am H.O. Moving on to chapter one. After the fake-out murders of who we assumed to be the main cast, we meet the real main cast here, and they're also unlikable. If you thought we killed the unlikable ones... To make this game a little bit more interesting, you're actually really stupid and you thought wrong. Yako Furio is like the leader, he's a mentor, he's not a master detective, he has no powers, he's just a normie guy, but they want him to be like the Kakashi or the Gojo so badly, but those mentor characters only work because they're interesting and because they get character development and they also usually maintain their position because they're extremely strong and help their younger counterparts along in their journey. And Yako's annoying and isn't in the narrative that much, and we'll talk about him a little bit more later, but he's a loser. Desuhiko Thunderbolt is an insufferable pervert, and I want this trope to be dead forever. Fubuki Clockford is the infantilized, like, dummy hot girl, but she's, like, really close to being actually interesting, but almost just simply is never enough. Halara Nightmare and Vivia Twilight. They are both good characters, in my opinion. They just keep the story going, and they're actually good at what they do, whereas Yako, Desuhiko, and Fubuki are all presented as grossly incompetent, which I also just think is a weird choice. Why is everyone so dumb? Chapter 1 is a pretty straightforward mystery. A watchsmith is framed for a murder. It's a string of serial murders that are based on an urban legend, so they all have the same MO. The urban legend is tied to the church, so we go to the church, talk to some people, and the priest of the church is like, you know, the people of Kanai Ward need salvation. And I was like, okay, can we please fast forward to the end? I know the priest did it. Also, there was like four suspicious people in this murder case. I thought they were maybe all co-conspirators, but there was only one other guy who committed murder. I didn't know which one of them was going to be the second one, but I knew it wasn't just the priest. I was still kind of bored. I was mostly in it because I was interested in the city. Like, Halara and Yuma are exploring this, like, wealthier district of town. It's clearly where a lot of office workers go to work. There's a museum. There's a really gorgeous cafe. The game is really beautiful. Like, I really like the environment that it's set in, but this is kind of when I fell for the charm of the aesthetic was in this chapter. In each of the chapters, Yuma is partnered with one of his fellow master detectives. This is the Halara chapter. Again, I like them as a character. We don't know anything much about them because none of the characters get good development. I'm probably going to say that a billion times, but it's just true. Halara is not explicitly stated to be non-binary, which they don't have to explicitly say it anyways. Um, I'm just frustrated that I didn't notice. I didn't clock one of my people. I couldn't believe it. I was annoyed. I was like, I was Googling to try and be like contrarian and be like, no, I'm sure they refer to them with a she somewhere. But the game only refers to them either with they, them pronouns or by name. And I didn't even notice. So clap to the writers for seamless representation. I also think maybe like Shinigami coming in with maybe transphobically charged dialogue distracted me from that because I was like, oh my gosh, this game is about to be problematic in a way that I don't like. But they didn't go there. Chapter two, besides the last chapter is hands down the best chapter of this game. It is so interesting. I'm gushing. The case is brought to us by Kurumi Wendy, who is a huge waste of a character. Um, She's an informant, so she, I guess, is, like, passively collecting information about Kanai Ward. I kept waiting for, like, 
the other shoe to drop with her character because she's so like innocent and nice and it's totally like "Uh uh-huh I know everything but like I'm not gonna tell you how I know it and like my grandpa used to live in Kanai Ward and then he disappeared a really long time ago so now I'm Kanai Ward's number one informant I'll do anything you need like she's very um I feel like she could be a blueprint for uh one of those NPC TikTokers but the whole time I was like she's too like nice normie girl kind of a mary sue like where's she getting the information why is she getting chased by the police i really thought that they were going to go for a betrayal storyline with her that doesn't happen there is more to her plot line but it has nothing to do with anything that she does at all anyways she asks us to solve a mystery at her school because her friend aiko died six months prior to the main story and it was ruled a suicide but everyone has reason to believe that it was a murder So this murder case wasn't properly investigated. So she asks us to come to the school and figure things out. We go to the school and there are four girls who are suspects in the Ico murder case. And the main motivation is that they're all actresses in the theater club and Ico always got the lead roles. So there's an assumption that they wanted to kill her to get her out of the way. Like it's very soap opera. And maybe it's just like my bias because I'm a theater person. But the plot is so good. Like it's so juicy. I love what's happening with these girls. In game, we're at the dress rehearsal for their school's show. And they perform this play about two princesses who had to flee due to their country being invaded. And one of them continues to be a ruler in a neighboring country. And the other built a resistance of commoners from the ground up. And they fight to get their home back. And even though they succeed in fending off their invaders, their respective factions only want to see one of them be queen. And so they want to avoid a civil war because the tensions are rising and they know that the people won't accept if one of them just like passively backs down and surrenders. So the two of them do like a Russian roulette thing with poisoned wine to decide who's going to be the queen. And it's so emotional and it's so charged. And these two girls, I'm obsessed with them. The play ends here because one of the glasses is actually poisoned. And so the girl, Karin dies on stage but it was fascinating this is some of the best acting i've seen in like an anime style video game maybe ever it's genuinely so good like does anybody know if this is a real play anybody who's played this game about these two princesses also like where's the fire emblem game with this premise like it's so perfect for that style of game i was so entertained the only thing that i found unrealistic was that the game was telling me that the climax was happening at the 45 minute mark when you know this is a three hour show I thought the game was so bad up until this point, and then during this chapter, I was literally having the time of my life. I couldn't put it down. Of the four girls, you find out that three of them conspired to kill Karin because they know that Karin was the one who murdered Aiko. And we find out that this was a group effort because the three all have a picture with Aiko and Karin is like not in it. We also learn here that Karin killed Aiko by smashing her in the head with a brick as like a random act of passion. And to me, this was a bit of a cop-out. I thought it was really poorly motivated. It was ruled a suicide because she takes Aiko's shoes and puts them on the roof. Also, these games, there's no like fingerprint evidence. There's no hair evidence. There's no DNA being scanned for so if you haven't played this game and you're wondering like why these aren't being solved like real crimes like how come no one dusted the shoes i have that question too you're not alone i thought this was kind of a cop out because we don't really know karen so like why is she smashing a girl with a brick that seems like a lot i also think as sad as this is i think it would have been more interesting if aiko actually had unalived herself because then you know some of these characters are gonna have to confront that and that's really hard Like, it's a really ugly truth, but it does happen. And instead of, like, pointing fingers at someone else, like, maybe they'd have to look inwards and think of, like, why? And, like, why they're projecting these feelings onto somebody else? And I also think that it would be, like, extra sad if Karin was innocent and then these three girls, like, killed her as an act of revenge. But then it's, like, pointless because Karin didn't commit the initial act in the first place. Like, I think Karin, you know, fancying some skull bashing on a random Tuesday or whatever, I think that like narratively kind of serves to justify the actions of the other girls. Like, I don't know. I just feel like the setup is really strong, but then there's more to this premise that we can needle. I think the game gets like really close to painting like a fully well-rounded picture, but they just don't take it all the way there. I also thought it was really, really strange that Kurumi, even though that she's claiming Aiko is her best friend, it's so strange to me that she doesn't have a relationship with these other three girls who Aiko was, like, clearly really close with. Like, I would understand if maybe they weren't all besties, but it was really sus to me that Kurumi is not in the group photo. 
So that's also why I thought Kurumi was hiding something. Based on the ending of the game, I understand why they didn't choose to make her some sort of traitor, but I was like, she's not in the picture. Who is her suspicious grandpa who we don't know and we don't meet? Where is he? Where did he go? What's his story? Also, how come there's a moment at the end where she like randomly runs away from Yuma in a situation where they should obviously stay together? And I was like, oh my god, she's betraying us and it's happening right now. But that's not what happens. I think they had opportunities to flesh her out, but unfortunately, Kurumi is relegated to being the innocent girl whose main function is to justify what the protagonist is doing because she's always there to be like, I think you're still a good guy, though. I don't think you actually have done anything wrong. But she's really just around to remind Yuma that he's a good guy. But is he? I'm not sold on that. This is Desuhiko's partner chapter, and I hate his guts, but I only bring him up because he uses his disguise to get Yuma and himself into this all-girls school. They get into drag, and there's a Drag Race reference. And if that's not progress, I don't know what is. In chapter 3, Yuma gets kidnapped and meets Makoto Kagutsuchi, who is the CEO of Amaterasu and is obviously related to Yuma in some way, because after their initial meeting, he has a line where he says, so he's my ellipses question mark. So right after he gets kidnapped by Makoto, for whatever reason, he gets kidnapped by the resistance and taken to like the slums of Kanai Ward. And there he meets all of the leaders. The main guy's name is Shachi. And then he meets four other people who are all, I don't know, the sub leaders. And they all have kind of different opinions on what to do with the resistance. Shachi is very nonviolent, but some of them are like, actually, we should maybe do something that's a little bit more aggressive. So there's this whole convoluted arc where Yuma runs around town and he sets up what he thinks are security cameras, but they're actually bombs. And then they rat him out. They betray Yuma. They call him a terrorist. Yuma goes back to the resistance and is like, why are you doing this to me? And Shachi found dead on the roof of the resistance building. They do this like really heavy handed, like terrorist arc. And then we're supposed to like feel bad for the resistance, but we also only know them for the one chapter. And then they're gone for the remainder of the game. And the mystery is so stupid because one of the guys kills him and floods like the financial district because the safes that hold money are airtight, so they float, apparently. Um, so his intention is to like use the flood to more easily transport the safes and then like break them open and steal all the money. So I was like, okay, this seems all really random. Um, the mystery wasn't that entertaining. But this is the Fubuki partner chapter, and her power is one of the more classic, more interesting ones. She can turn back time, but only for a few seconds, and it's very like physically draining on her. It is my headcanon that her using her time powers has a negative impact on her brain and how she like perceives her reality, which is why she, like, let alone be a detective, I wouldn't trust this girl to make ice. The only things though that make fubuki also stand apart from the rest of the cast is that she actually has some exposition we know that she comes from a wealthy family they're responsible for governing time in the world she is a princess she's lived a sheltered life she comes from this rich family and she wants to be an adventurer so she has a background and a motivation propelling her forward that's huge for rain code major basic objectives Characters having simple wants. Where's the Emmy? Video Game of the Year award. I don't know why. I was just like desperate for a reason to like her. Like I felt like I had to. But it it was really hard. <laughs> oh, sorry. I have another point to make about the mystery of this chapter. It's really impersonal to Yuma's journey. Like we don't know this cast of characters. There's no stake in this. The resistance, like I said, is gone after this chapter. So it all feels really impersonal and it allows a lot of distance from the narrative. But I think the game really wants you to feel emotional for what's going on. And it's not even in a way that the game like takes itself really seriously. It does in the last chapter, but like everything up to this point has been pretty over the top. But again, like if we're trying to emulate the Danganronpa formula, Danganronpa really works because it's isolated stories that follow one cast of characters through their whole journey from beginning to end. They'll undergo personal changes as the narrative goes on and circumstances are altered and stakes are raised. And it's it's really interesting to see that pot boil over. Raincode can't achieve that. 
with the way it solves individual mysteries. Speaking of wanting you to care, we're on to chapter four, and it is so convoluted. Chapter four is doing double duty because it's the Yako and the Vivia chapter. Vivia is a really cool character who I think they also missed the mark on just enough that it's bothersome. And like I said, Yako sucks, but the game wants you to think that Yako is incredible. Yako, normie investigator, he has no power. He's from Kanai Ward, so you would hope that he is our kind of guide throughout this game, but he's too scared to do anything because the police here are terrifying. He spends like almost the entire game up to this point in what little screen time he has being like, no, we shouldn't do anything. Keep your head down. Don't get into trouble. Don't get involved. But in this chapter, he commits murder. And it's from out of left field. Make it make sense. Like, I just don't... I, I'm i speechless. I have no words. Like, I was so... Wow. I'm, I'm just going to read from my notes for this part because I'm going to get lost because it's so stupid. I'm not going to explain it in full, but these are the basic pieces of what happens. Makoto, remember, he's the CEO. He invites Yuma to a secret lab in Amaterasu's basement where they're working on, like, service robots. It's nothing secret. There is a real secret lab in this game, but it's not this one. There's no reason for this particular lab that we go to on this day to be secret. So Yuma goes, and there's a major police presence there, because apparently an assassin has been hired to kill the head researcher, Dr. Weska. The head peacekeeper, Yomi Hellsmile, that's his name, he hates the detectives because he's comically villainous, and they get in the way of his unjust execution of the law. Like, he's evil. So anyways, Yuma is here, but they can't move around freely because the peacekeepers hate detectives and the other detectives catch up because Desuhiko puts them all in disguises. Weska is in a lab behind an intense security system and apparently he was hoping the assassin would come and get him because he wants to escape Kanai Ward. So his plan is to pour acid on the assassin's body because he would die in the security system. So he would burn the body with acid and then he would fake his own death and flee. Anyways, he gets stabbed in the back three times by the murderer and dies. The knife has an F inscribed on the handle because the assassin's name is Fink, but also Yako Furio could have these knives with the F on them. I realized that like pretty early in the chapter when I saw the knife and I was like, oh, Yako did it. That doesn't make sense. Um, okay. After we find Weska's dead body, we go outside and Yako has been murdered by an actual assassin. So just when you thought the assassination hit plotline was fake and that Yako was the hired assassin or maybe Yako is Fink, the murder artist or whatever that character is called, a real assassin walks away from Yako being murdered. And Yako is also murdered with an F knife. And right next to him is a map of the lab and a photo of a man whose face is obscured by blood and he's standing next to like a gorgeous girl. So I wonder whose wife that is, especially because we found that picture right next to Yako's dead body. The game really asks you. They show a picture of Yomi, they show a picture of, they show a picture of Yomi, they show a picture of Yako, and they show a picture of someone else, and they're all with that girl. And the game in full seriousness is like, which person do you think this picture belongs to? Who's the guy? And I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding? We found it next to his body. I'm supposed to believe that Yomi had a wife? (laughs) Obviously it was going to be Yako. Get serious. Get serious. I'm paying attention. I'm playing this game. I'm interested in what's going on. Help me. Help me have fun. Please. I just couldn't believe it. I was like, okay, so I know Yako did it. And I know you're going to do a bad job at telling me why. Because character development is something that Rain Code refuses to get on board with. So the girl in the picture, Revelation, is Yako's wife. And this is the first we're hearing about her. This is the first she's ever even been hinted at. Yako has literally had like not even crumbs that hint at his background. Like literally nothing. Zero. And now he has a wife. A wife who he's willing to commit murder for. In revenge because apparently she died many years ago working under dr weska because she was a whistleblower because he was doing something unethical and i guess yako has been holding on to that for a really long time but all of a sudden now is ready to do the kill to do murder karumi has nothing to do with this plot line but she's so sus throughout the whole game that i would have had an easier time believing that she was the assassin and she's not even here she is missing for the entirety of this chapter after being with Yuma at the very beginning, but she's literally just waiting outside. Anyways, Yako murders Weska, but then there's this second knife and an actual assassin because a real hit was taken out on Yako. That was the real hit. There was no hit taken out 
on Wesca. Like, Fink is actually an assassin who's real within the game. He's not like that random urban legend from earlier. And he was hired to kill Yako. Fake hit was taken out on Wesca. And then I think Yako being the murderer is ultimately dissatisfying because the game brings out its tiny violin and wants you to feel so upset because the whole group is like going through this whole emotional roller coaster being like, oh my gosh, our leader is dead. And I'm like, was he really your leader? You've lived here for no time. And Yuma has really been kind of a free agent. Like Yako hasn't really been helping anybody. Yuma has better connections with the main cast of master detectives because that's who we're going on journeys with. Like I touched on, this is also the Vivia chapter. He plays a really interesting role because his power is astral projection. He's the only character who can see that Yuma is being followed around by a death god because she takes the form of a little ghost. So it's really interesting that he threatens to kill Yuma in this chapter because he thinks Yuma is holding this deep, devastating power that will ruin the world. Like he thinks Yuma is like a Pandora's box. And so he gives Yuma a run for his money. And there's actual interesting opposition here, especially because Vivia has been pretty quiet the whole game. He's like the sleepy, lazy kind of archetype. Um... But then he comes through in a really interesting way at the end here and is like, I don't know if Yuma is going to be able to handle the truth that Yako is the murderer. It's interesting that Vivia is also concerned for Yuma because he knows that he has this death power. And Vivia has been able to pretty easily connect that the reason why the true murderers are dying at the end of each case is because Yuma is the one solving them. And also Vivia is smart, so he's clued on a lot sooner than the other characters that Yako was involved in this in some way. Anyways, that's all that I wanted to cover today. I feel like this is such an odd place to stop, but if I talk about the last chapter, that is such a different set of information and content warnings because the game, for the most part, like I said, it's pretty unserious. And then in the last chapter, they really go, so you let your guard down, huh? I'm about to ruin your entire fucking life. (laughs) It's crazy. It's insane. It's very good. And I think the payoff is wonderful in the last chapter like it makes the game worth playing it's just brutal that the rest of the game kind of sucks and also like most of what i've talked about thus far has like nothing to do with the ending i can pretty much talk about it on its own and the ending also introduces different contradictions but i feel like i would need to dedicate like a 30 minute video just outlining the plot and then like talking about how i feel So if this has caught your attention and you want me to do that, I will gladly do the Ultimate Mystery of Kanai Ward video. I'm also kind of curious about the DLC. I don't know if I want to pay for it. Um, If someone wants to tip me 20 bucks, I will buy it, but I don't expect anybody to do that. The DLC has piqued my curiosity, especially because obviously a big complaint of mine is lack of character development, and those are all character-specific stories. So I'm like, okay, I'm wondering if this extra side content that you have to pay more money for serves as a band-aid solution after the fact. Anywho, that's all for today. Feel free to like and subscribe if this was interesting to you. I would love to get to a point where I am monetized on this channel. I have the watch time. People are watching me. So if you want to, that'd be pretty sweet. Upcoming, I'm working on a video about the Gravity Rush series as a whole. I have a Fire Emblem Awakening video that I'm working on. So if any of those are interesting to you, maybe turn on the notification bell, maybe subscribe for when they come out. Again, I'm going to try and make content more regularly now that my life is kind of uh, stabilized. And I think I have a little bit more time to do this. Anyways, that's all for today. Good rain to you.